Here we go. So here we go. We are live here today from Reno, Nevada. I'm Dr. Martin Rutherford. I am a chiropractor and a, a certified functional medicine practitioner. At least that's what's pertinent to what we're going to be talking about today, which is fibromyalgia. This is Dr. Randall Gates, a board certified chiropractic neurologist, and we may delve into that a little bit farther uh, in the future. Our topic today is going to be fibromyalgia. We're going to we're going to speak to you from personal experience. I, I can speak to you from very personal experience. I got pneumonia about 11 years ago. Next thing you know, I had fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, which we talked about last week, uh, peripheral neuropathy, and celiac disease. And that too. <laughs> so, uh, but fibromyalgia is, some of those things are related, and fibromyalgia is what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, we've treated a lot of fibro patients, and we've had the same confusions and the same questions that everybody else had when we started, because frankly, when I contracted, it was a little bit more than 11 years ago, nobody knew anything, almost. Um, and the people who did know were kind of on the outs, and then there was a lot of confusing data, and we're hoping to, to the degree that we can, and based on our experience, clear a lot of that up for you today, and in little vignettes and things in the future that we're gonna do online. First things first, fibromyalgia, horrendous term, stupid term, term that doesn't mean anything, dumb term, wherever you want to go with this, it's a terrible term. I don't like the term, I don't like, I, I, I don't like um, naming a term or I don't like labeling a patient, first of all, because fibromyalgia has come to have a very bad connotation and that connotation is, oh yeah, fibromyalgia, yeah, it's in your head, right? You just need to pull up your big boy pants and you just need to go and, you know, you just need to like tough it out. Um, maybe you need to go see a psychologist. Uh, well, there's, all your blood tests are normal, everything's normal, you don't really have it. I mean, this is fibromyalgia, right? Your, your husband or your significant other is wondering if, you know, maybe they should be hanging around because you're kind of having a tough time. Your doctors are saying you're okay. I went through all this. So it sounds like this comes from here <laughs> or here. I went through this. So I get that, and, and the term fibromyalgia has a really negative connotation. The thing I like about functional medicine is we're not really looking at a diagnosis. We're looking at treating the patient or assessing the patient or diagnosing the patient based on what's wrong. Okay, you come in to me. I think you probably got a lot in Dr. Gates. Us, we're a team with this stuff. I think you got a lot better things to do with your time and effort and your finances than to invest it in going into a doctor's office and spending time telling them you have fibromyalgia and, and, and taking time out of your day and so on and so forth. And, and so you, we understand that people are sitting in front of us are sick. So you, you need to look at the person and hear their history and say, okay, what systems in the body could be causing that? Fibromyalgia doesn't give us that opportunity. Fibromyalgia means pain in the muscle fiber. Isn't that what it means? That's what I mean. How, you want to you you maybe even take it from there just a little bit and, and, and maybe go into fibromyalgia, what it actually means. When I do my talks, I have, a, I have like an hour-long talk that I do on this that I have on DVD. And we talk about the brain, how people are going to tell you it's in your head. It's kind of in your head, but not the way they mean. Okay? And, uh, and so in that DVD, we talk about the brain. We talk about the pain. We talk about how the pain is much worse than a fibromyalgia patient. We talk about left brain and white, right brain and why you have certain symptoms of lack of motivation and brain fog and short-term memory loss and all these things. We talk about physiology, about why you might have heart palpitations and anxiety and night sweats. And, 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 and none of that is embraced in the term fibromyalgia. So we're going to use that term simply to communicate here. But that term needs to go. Something else needs to happen. But for the meantime, that's how, they, that's how we communicate to patients who have it. And there is a way to diagnose it, and there is a way to understand what it is. It's just not the way you've been exposed to. And, um, and it's the term that they use in the literature. Right. So we really need to get, use that term just for a matter of communicating. But let's go back to fibromyalgia. Okay. Fibromyalgia, it means pain in the muscle fibers. That gives us zero zero information and data on what's causing your problem or how to treat it. I'm going to let Dr. Gates take it from here for a few minutes because we were talking about this right before we got on camera. 
right. and, and, and fibromyalgia and the different causes and the different categories that we have seen consistently over a period of years and, and, and the data that we use to address these problems pretty successfully. So, so let's backtrack back to when fibromyalgia was first being diagnosed. Let's go to the 1990 American College of Rheumatology's guidelines. Basically at that point they noticed this this cohort of the pain population patients who don't have rheumatoid arthritis, who don't have lupus, who don't have things like scleroderma, these are all autoimmune diseases where the immune system kills a person's own tissues. And they knew these people were having pain but they couldn't explain it. So they figured out this exam where basically they push all over the person's body. It's called an aldometry exam. And there are certain points you're supposed to press on the body with five kilograms of pressure. And if the person had pain at 11 out of the 18 points and they didn't have rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, you could therefore diagnose them as having fibromyalgia. And if you're truly a fibromyalgia patient, you probably have 118 points right, on your exactly. body that are tender. Exactly. And so the evolution of fibromyalgia happened over about 20 years, such that in 2010, the American College of Rheumatology revised their guidelines. Basically, they're saying now that if someone has widespread pain throughout their body, you don't even have to be that tender. As long as this pain syndrome is causing you to suffer on a daily basis um, and there's no other identifiable cause, then we can diagnose you with fibromyalgia. Now, that being said... So in other words, for those people who want to know how you diagnose fibromyalgia, in the medical model, there's no tools. There's no tools. There's Absolutely. no tools. There's no blood test. No. There's no neurological test. But I'm going to go into that too. So, sorry, Kevin, about the microphone. So, anyways, however, we now know there are a host of things that are wrong with these fibromyalgia patients. So, even though we don't have a great test for it, we know that all of you suffering with fibromyalgia patients have certain commonalities. And how do we find out what those are? Well, a variety of ways. Because everybody comes in and interviews, wants to see a test. Well, you know we've what? Been pretty if you have about $100,000 that, that you want to pay out of pocket, then <laughs> we can do those tests. And because they entail doing functional MRI right. studies, I right. have a study here where it talks about how fibromyalgia patients don't shut off the pain circuits in their brain. So the pain that you experience coming into your brain, you just keep thinking about it, basically, and your brain doesn't shut it off. There are a host of studies talking about Hashimoto's thyroiditis. There are a lot of people who are talking about how if the reason Dr. Gates mentions that is if we we've talked had, about it last week. Yeah, if we've had if we've had a thousand fibro patients, what every one of them has Hashimoto's. A lot of them have fibro. Ninety percent. Yes. Yeah. And then we also know, for example, these weird things such as though such as that the thyroid thyroid won't actually produce thyroid hormone if you inject the person with a hormone coming from the brain to the thyroid. Called TSH. The same thing happens with the adrenal gland. So these are just little snippets, and hopefully we'll go into more of these. But the bottom line is the fibromyalgia patient and their spouse and their family needs to know that there are real biochemical and anatomical reasons to explain why they're experiencing so much pain. And you also need to own this that the pain is not in the muscles, the pain right. is in your brain and spinal cord. That's where the problem is. Okay. So we can go on to the next topic. Oh, no, Did you want me to talk about the four groups? Well, we can talk about experience. the four groups. Where I would go from there would be a lot of the patients come in to us, um, and the patients come to us for a variety of reasons. A lot come to get better. <laughs> a lot come to find out if there's some information that they can get that they can fix themselves on their own. I usually open my talk by saying, you know, there's like 500 different things that could be going on with you relative to creating the abnormal pain syndrome that we are, since the early 1990s, calling fibromyalgia. Now, that's an exaggeration for me to make a point, but not much. <laughs> There's probably 80 or 100 different things, okay? Mm -hmm. There's the, and, and that's the point. So how do you diagnose 100 or 80 different things? Um, you do $100,000 worth of tests? Well, that would be a very limited practice, and that wouldn't benefit a whole lot of people. And the way you do it is you know and study the studies. You understand the mechanisms. You understand first that it's in the brain, the pain is in the brain and the spinal cord, and then you have to understand all of the things that affect that and cause it to break down. That's a lot of stuff. And it can't be assessed by testing. 
because we have been conditioned, which is why the medical model falls short on this. I'm going to say this every week. I'm not anti-medicine. Just understand, I went through this. You do it th through an extremely thorough history. There are ways to understand these things and at least point in the proper direction by doing it. Our histories run a half an hour to an hour. And they're lengthy. And they're necessary. And then you do it by doing an extremely thorough exam. A complete neurological exam. People come into us for fibromyalgia and they say to me, well, why are we going to do a neurological exam? Well, because it's in your head. <laughs> but it's not in your head like you're crazy. It's in your head like that's where your brain is perceiving this abnormal pain. And it is in your body because there's physiology in your body that is exacerbating areas of your nervous system that are creating this abnormal pain. And this is not theory. Dr. Gates had about 15 research papers here. And there's thousands. There's probably a couple thousand. And so you need to be aware of all that. There is not a one-shot deal. One of the things that we see online is people want to know, what are medications for, for fibromyalgia? There are none. There are medications to kill the pain by killing your brain, essentially. Yeah, or shutting your brain off. Or shutting your brain off. But there's really no medication for fibromyalgia because it's a multifactorial problem. In other words, the, the, one of the biggest things I want to I want to get here today is we can get 100 people to come in here with fibromyalgia. No two of them are exactly the like in, alike in the mechanisms that are affecting their brain or in the parts of their brain that are affected. It's like this big lottery that you have to hit. First of all, you have to take a history and do an exam to gather all the different pieces, all the different numbers that are that are involved in winning this lottery or making this diagnosis. Then then you have to put those numbers in order because there is a hierarchy of oh, treatment yeah. Oh, yeah. and you have to treat the right thing first because one thing is going to affect the other. If you think the body's not complicated, I mean, your liver does 350 things. Your liver might be involved in your fibromyalgia. Oh, and it might not. How do you know? You have to do a thorough exam. You have to take the time to do it. You have to do a thorough history. You have to know what you're doing. And that will then dictate the testing. That, you that at this point should be relatively confirmatory, shouldn't be a big surprise, but give us the details that you that you need to fill in the rest of um, of the story so that you can put those numbers in order and win the lottery. In other words, meaning stop the downward progress of your fibromyalgia, reverse it, usually substantially, and then understand the tools that you need so that you can continue to manage it on your own without having to see a bunch of doctors and a bunch of people who don't who kind of don't know what to do with you anyway and, and after like the third or fourth or fifth time you go into the MD and they don't know it and you see them kind of glance over and your files getting that kind of thick you're done let me go on that point go okay there's a chapter in Kelly's book of rheumatology on fibromyalgia and I'm sorry if I'm overly pedantic but we only do no, that no, no. on the same this point. is great this is great if you haven't gotten it like He's the research guy, okay, and this is this is what makes us a good team. <laughs> and we know that some of you are across the world in Switzerland watching this, and you may want to know where we get this information, so that's why I give it to you. But anyways, in this textbook, which is the gold standard textbook in rheumatology in the States here in the U.S., uh, they talk about how many rheumatologists don't even like treating fibromyalgia patients. No, they they may not they even accept them. Well. Yeah, because they're hard to deal with. Um, they have all these Emotional. complaints. There are many other comorbidities, as it's termed, you know. Suicidal. Suicidal ideation. There can be interstitial cystitis to migraines to depression, on and on and on. And on that point that you made about the drugs, here's a really nice article from Arthritis Research Therapies. And they said, many drug treatments for fibromyalgia have undergone limited study and have had negative results. Both the potential for medication therapy to relieve the symptoms and the potential to cause harm should be carefully considered in their administration. So just as Dr. Rutherford was saying, there's not one medication that cures fibromyalgia and everybody out there with fibromyalgia probably knows that. Probably know that maybe they got a little help with Cymbalta or a little help with Sabella. Or Our literally. average fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia patient walks in here is on what, 5 to 15 medications? Yeah. We had one that was on like what, 23? 20, it was over 20. Over 20 medications. That's, yeah, that's what, and that's insane. <laughs> And we have a hard time helping someone once they're on that. That many makes it a little difficult. Yeah. So do we want to go into the four groups of fibromyalgia patients? All right. So a lot of people want to know, you know, what's okay. So what's fibromyalgia? 
And again, I just got done saying it's a stupid term. Doesn't mean anything. Doesn't tell you. Does not tell you how to fix it. It doesn't tell you what's wrong. It puts you in a bad category, and so on and so forth. But and and listen, we're a good team, and we're a comedy team, right? <laughs> I'm the guy who's been practicing for a while, and uh, I just basically, I'm not the most academic guy on the planet. <laughs> I tend to go by what works and what doesn't work. And when you've seen as many patients as we have seen, you get to see consistent patterns. And the studies can say what they can say, but studies are limited. Mm -hmm. Studies are limited by, I mean, they're making billions of dollars out there doing studies now. So it's an industry. Studies are, you know, sometimes they're influenced by, you know, who's paying for them. But, you know, frequently they're just influenced by the fact, like, how, how easy is it to study the human being? Let's just say you're studying one particular aspect of the human being, nutrition and fibromyalgia, and the person is being studied stressed out of their mind. Right. So they're stressed. Good example. So they're putting their breath, so they're stressed, and they're in their cortisol, and, and they're checking their, their uh, B12 levels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, they have, and they're stressed out of their mind, and they're putting out these chemicals. Most people are aware of adrenaline when they put it out, but it puts out way more than that. It puts out chemicals that damage your brain. It, cont it contributes to your brain fog, your short-term memory loss. It can contribute to damaging your lungs. It can contribute to damaging your immune system. It can get. Uh, it can, and then it can contribute to damaging your gut. Oh, which by the way might influence your ability to absorb vitamin B12. But they're going to study you. It's hard. It's just hard. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get enough people mm -hmm. to get into a study to find. It's just hard. So the studies are great, and they're scientific, and they're this, but this is why one person tells you to eat salt, one person tells you not to eat salt. You know, one person tells you it's good to drink wine, one person tells you it's not, it's, it's, and people are confused, okay? We're not confused, <laughs> because where we work is the rubber, was where the rubber meets the road. Our patients get better, but, but it's because we've had to combine the studies that, that Dr. Gates has so uh, accomplished in, in, in pulling together for us, along with, um, Re responses to care and so on and so forth. Yeah. So we have a fairly strong idea that we're pretty immovable on relative to what fibromyalgia is. Mm -hmm. And we have seen some um, some things that have shocked me beyond anything I could possibly imagine. I remember my first fibromyalgia patient mm -hmm. and they were telling me about their sexual abuse and they were telling me about all their symptoms, they were telling me about their drugs and I just went like, whoa. What am I getting myself into here? Mm -hmm. And um, and we now know what we've gotten ourselves into, and we have a pretty good idea what's going on. Dr. Gates mentioned that there are four different. Um, we have, I guess, we have essentially, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely, together what we believe are the four groups of fibromyalgia. I hate that term, but fibromyalgia patients. We need to communicate. Um, that is. Um, based on our observations, and I'm going to let Dr. Gates take over on that because it's mainly uh, a lot of his research and a lot of his observations, a lot of what we've used to help people to stop this this downward spiral, excuse me, and reverse it and so on and so forth. Used it myself, by the way. I'm in pretty darn good shape, I might add. Yeah. But go ahead. Okay. So the first group of fibromyalgia patients that we don't commonly encounter because we don't give out narcotics here we don't prescribe medications, are those who are addicted to narcotics. And it's a whole realm of its own that I'm not going to go into uh, to a worldwide audience. <laughs> but just know certain people become very dependent on these narcotic medications. They may be diagnosed with fibromyalgia, and only because I have a lot of friends and family in the medical field do I hear about their opinions about fibromyalgia patients. And I believe it's those who are addicted to these drugs that give the fibromyalgia patient population some of its stigma. Let's just say it that way. And I hope that doesn't sound prejudiced in any way. It's just that is a fact of the matter. No, we have to stick to, we're patient, trying to be objective. Exactly. Here. The fibro okay. patient needs to know. These people are looking in because they want to stop searching everywhere. Right. And they want to get some real data. The next group of fibromyalgia patients have typically endured atrocious physical, sexual, or emotional abuse. Well, verbal. Verbal. And it's it's heartbreaking when we hear these these case histories. Time and time and time again, and it is so ridiculously common, and it is well cited in the literature and the textbooks relative to this issue. Now, what you need to know out there is that when you are under severe stress, chronically, from whatever mechanism, whether it's physical, sexual, emotional, verbal, whatever, those stress hormones make your spinal cord learn pain. Let me say that over again. They make the stress hormones 
make your spinal cord learn pain. We're getting to the part about it's in your head. <laughs> yeah. So if we had a patient who's a plasma physicist, right. and his son, I think was 11, and was more advanced in mathematics than anyone at the local university here uh, in Reno. And basically it's because this little kid did nothing but math. <laughs> so if you do things a lot, you get good at them. That's neuroplasticity. Well, there can, there can be neuroplasticity in the pain pathways, and stress hormones are one of the key drivers of that mechanism. Meaning your pathways, your brain, your nervous system can learn pain. And only one more tangent on that subject. All of you out there who have fibro and have been exposed to awful circumstances need to get the book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, by Robert Sapolsky from Stanford but University. they do get ulcers. They do. But right? you should get the book. But the book is awesome. It's phenomenal. <laughs> it's the best book on stress, and we'll probably mention it every week. We yeah, you'll love it. You'll love it. All of our patients have loved so it. They get it. So the next group of fibromyalgia patients have immune... Okay, well, can I go back to that yep. for one second? Would, would it be fair to say that that the, the sexual, the physical abuse, the emotional traumas, um, uh, would it be fair to say that they affect the brain by getting into a certain emotional part of the brain and they kind of stick there? They do. You can look at it from that standpoint, and largely it's because in addition of, to what you just got done. Yeah, saying. because is, what I have noticed, and I and I don't, and this may be, and we're just talking here. Okay, this mm -hmm. is how we figure it out. But I, I kind of and make it analogous to when you go to a movie. If you were to go to a, let's say one of these crazy movies where they're chainsawing people to death and all that type of stuff, if you were to go to that movie and watch it without the music, it would be pretty non-issue. Right. Would you agree? I mean, I mean, it'd be silent. You'd be watching somebody go <laughs> like that. You would hear nothing, right? But if you get that music, does that not engage the the limbic emotional does, absolutely, system? Absolutely. And that's what drives that into the brain. And frankly, your brain does know the difference between reality and not when that is driven in there. But when it gets in that emotional system, isn't it kind of there? It gets in there. You know, that's where. And learning the limbic system. And isn't sexual the, abuse and lim physical abuse and stuff like that, doesn't that kind of raise the emotions to the point oh, where it keeps oh, your brain? This is just something I encounter time and time absolutely. again in the consults where, where patients kind of like, or, or we're hoping that was kind of in the back. But it's not you. You see what I'm saying? This right. is the point I want to make. It's not you. It's in there. You guys, and he's going to talk about this in a minute. We're going to go on to the third one. But it gets in there, and it has your brain firing off 24-7, literally for the rest of your life. You can't go to sleep, your brain's going a million miles an hour, you can't get rid, you can't stay asleep, you wake up, you can't go back to sleep. This is not a joke, and, it, and you, it's not personality disorder. No. That's what Dr. Gates is talking about, okay? Yeah. So, so yeah, go on so with that. I am, go on I'll, I'll, three, I'll end on that. that. So basically, with the patients who've been through these horrible stressors, uh, their brain learns the stress, and so their brain is always wound up. That's what they're showing relative to the stress response. So it's just ready to go off with the drop of a hat. Um, and as Dr. Rutherford said, it kind of becomes a perseveration. Perseveration means your brain can't shut that process off. Think of a Parkinsonian tremor. That's kind of a physical perseveration. But a mental perseveration is where you just can't stop thinking about it. And so the pain the and stress keeps going around. Exactly, just keeps yeah. going through the person's head. And I, gosh, I have a study here somewhere where they talk about exactly that, where a certain part of the brain is involved in not shutting off these these negative emotional opinions of the pain. That's the best way I can say it in lay language. Okay, so there's that group. Then there's a group who has autoimmune or immune inflammation. We talked about a study last week from um, Clinical Rheumatology, 2014, where they said that Hashimoto's is highly associated with fibromyalgia, basically, which we they said, seen, they said 10% right, right, of the and 10 of the, 10 of the population has Hashimoto's. Our is it's considerably more than that. I think they're saying 10% of the population has Hashimoto's, not 10% of the population. Ah, see, I misunderstood the study. So, okay. but, you know. There's problem with studies. But there, can't read them. It was a nice, <laughs> it was a nice, it was a nice piece of work to just come out and acknowledge what we've been seeing, such that the immune inflammation makes your spinal cord, little pain cells, learn pain dramatically. Hashimoto's is an autoimmune problem that attacks your thyroid, by the way. Thank you. Okay. It's okay. No, I, I get ahead of myself. And so Hashimoto's is just one example. And we see signs of immune inflammation on our laboratory work and many of our patients. There's a, study, there's a test called C-reactive protein that we run on every one of our patients. 
I think it was chapter 31 or chapter 32 of Kelly's book, Rheumatology, where they talk all about C-reactive protein. And when C-reactive protein, an inflammatory marker, when it's elevated, that is associated with chronic widespread pain. So immune inflammation is definitely a key player. Huge this player. Whole, huge player in this huge person experience in a lot of myalgia. You know, now, and inflammation is a big deal now. Everybody's got inflammation. They're right. selling you pomegranate juice right. and they're selling you. Oh, the cactus, juice, the cactus. Whatever. Right. It's, and there's always going to be a new one, okay? I mean, it's going to be like whatever it's going to be. But there's so many different causes of inflammation. Shouldn't we kind of figure out that, what that is? Shouldn't we figure out what's causing the inflammation as to just dousing it every day with this expensive juice for like the next, you know, <laughs> 25 years, like every day, and a shot of the juice, and then we got all the multi level marketing thing. <clears throat> I'm not a big multi-level marketing guy, and I'm, and I'm going to say the other thing. This C-reactive protein. I was just writing. I was just reading something two days ago from a very prominent doctor, who I hear about a lot. I'm not going to say whose name it is because he writes a very popular newsletter. Says, ah, C-reactive protein. I don't think that's a very good marker. I got to tell you something. Your C-reactive protein is. I had a guy in here yesterday. His, his C-reactive protein is 50. I know what you're talking about. You know yes. what I'm talking about. Yeah. And he said, well. Is that a big deal? How many 50s have we seen? Like not like a three. Ton. Yeah, it's a big <laughs> deal. Years, it should be yeah. three, like three. It's like three. below three. Like should below be below three. 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 <laughs> but this guy's doctors told him, eh, you know, it's probably okay. It's probably just because your gout was up. Um, gout is a, an inflammatory thing. But I'm only making this point because you're out there looking if you're watching this. And you're out, and you're probably getting this guy's newsletter. You're getting that guy's newsletter. You're getting this guy's newsletter. We don't do that. We can't afford to do that. We have people that are in here who are sick, and we need to know what's going on. C-reactive protein is an extremely cost-effective test. Yes. And we look at that C-reactive protein ESR the set, set mm -hmm. rates and stuff. Yeah. And I'm gonna tell you, these are inexpensive tests that can tell us a whole lot about whether you got chronic inflammation, whether you have an autoimmune problem, or so on and so forth. And this. What, how, how much, what percentage of fibromyalgia would you say the first category is, the people who are... I, you know, I really can't say because we don't see them here. Okay, fair enough. We have a very unique They're not gonna, population. You guys are watching out there. You're not going to okay. search us out if, we're, if you're in that That's situation. true. Of our population, inflammation and autoimmunity, man, it is, I think it's probably this enormous, underappreciated... Uh, it referred to in the literature, but not appreciated as a clinical entity um, population in the country. And if you're sitting there and you got all these fibromyalgia symptoms, we'll talk about it as soon as he's done. I'm gonna tell you, you probably have it. So, mm -hmm. else? Okay. And then the last group is basically a combination of those who've been through severe stress and now have autoimmune issues. We also see a host of those. It's a combination of the last two groups, but stress is big. Stress kind of crosses. It's huge. Some it's of the huge barriers for a fibromyalgia patient, and you're not going to get better until those stress pathways are wound down. You're not going to get better until you're sleeping. I mean, here's a study somewhere over here about how fibromyalgia patients, their cortisol is off, so their stress hormones tend to wind up at night. So cortisol you're waking up at night and you can't sleep. Adrenal glands. Exactly. So cortisol and adrenaline come from the adrenal glands, amongst other things, but the adrenal glands are waking up at night such that now the person can't sleep and so now they have insomnia or they have some sort of parasomnia or sleep disorder they can't get rested they wake up tired they have pain all over their body does this sound like you <laughs> so those are the four groups of fibromyalgia patients at a yeah. glance yeah there there and their stresses can also be a trigger stress is kind of Interesting, because in, again, in the DVD that, or in the talk that I do, well, which is on DVD, but in the talk that I do um, on fibromyalgia, we talk about the triggers. Here are the triggers. My trigger was pneumonia. So, in other words, I had a trigger where there was an overwhelming infection. It affected my immune system. We may or may not get into this later. The immune system ultimately ended up apparently attacking my gut, which was already a mess, and then my thyroid and a couple of other things. Stress can be a trigger, but stress, if you have been sexually abused or emotionally abused, or if you have stress like that, it's going to perpetuate your problem. Or it could be a trigger. You walk into the house, your husband's laying on the floor, you think the person, you think he's dead. All of a sudden, you go into this massive stress response, this fight flight response. Five minutes later, he gets up. <laughs> he's not, he's not dead, but it's set off. It has set off now a trigger because it affects your brain. We're going to get to the brain next, because mm -hmm. that's, I think, that where we go next. But it sets off your brain. It sets off all these chemistry 
that, and then it can set off immune problems in and of themselves or through the brain, and the next thing you know, you got this wide constellation of symptoms, and everybody thinks you're crazy. Okay. The other, by the way, other triggers would be this: uh, motor vehicle accidents. We're both chiropractors. Okay. I had a patient yesterday who thought our workups. Boy, this is going to sound self-serving, but they thought our workup was pretty thorough because. It was a husband and wife who were in here. They both had something called small fiber peripheral neuropathy. We're not going to get into that because that's not what we're talking about today. But here is the thing. Same thing as fibro. There's 80 different things that can cause small fiber peripheral neuropathy. Well, maybe not 80, but there's a lot. Okay. But each of those was different. Each of their cause was different. And one of them had full body pain, thought she was in fibromyalgia. Turns out that she had a problem that caused her wrists to be diagnosed as carpal tunnel, but it wasn't technically carpal tunnel. That was causing pain going up her arms. And she had something else causing peripheral neuropathy, which is numbness, tingling, burning in the feet. The gentleman had a neck problem that was causing arm pain. Notice they had the same symptoms, but he had something going on that was causing a peripheral neuropathy. Had we not been, here's the thing about chronic pain, and here's why I think you chiropractors were uniquely because most of the chiropractors are in this. There's medical doctors in this being functional medicine. There's medical doctors. There's there's uh, natu some naturopaths and stuff. Functional medicine and uh, board certified chiropractic neurology are very well defined disciplines. Even though everybody's kind of now a functional medicine doctor, mm -hmm. and um, and chiropractors are kind of in a good spot to to diagnose these because not unlike these folks, like say your fibromyalgia patient. How do you know it's coming from your neck? How do you know it's coming from your back? How do you know it's coming from an autoimmune problem? How do you know it's coming from a brain? I'm going to tell you right now, you don't, okay? Because it took us a while to figure it out. But we have unique ability to also factor in the musculoskeletal system into our diagnosis because we have big chiropractors. All of these other uh, things that we've learned, we've learned in postgraduate courses and then in, grad, in, in uh, specialty courses and stuff like that. But you need to be able to know, if, as a fibromyalgia, is your neck pain coming from your neck? Or, and what led me to this was, uh, was the fact that a, a trauma can set off fibromyalgia. See, you know, it was a time before I got into this, people would get in car accidents. And they'd get in a car accident, and all of a sudden they'd have fibromyalgia. I, I didn't really understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. But that trauma affected them. Now, what was it? Was it their neck, or was it that it had set off an immune response? And if that patient kept going everywhere and they were tender and they were inflamed and they kept kept getting all this, in retrospect, it had set off an immune response. They went to the chiropractor, they got worse. They went to the physical therapist, they got worse. I'm mentioning this because this is a lot of you out there. The other thing is uh, sometimes it would set off a cerebellar problem. We're not going to get into that, I don't think, but a cerebellar problem will cause you to have tightness in your neck versus an autoimmune problem. So I think that a lot of people come in, I'm answering the question as chiropractors, you know, why are you doing this? We're doing this because frankly we have the best background. We get, how much do we get in, 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 in how much education do we get in the musculoskeletal system versus right. the two to six hours right. that the medical model gets in their basic thing. So that answers that question. But triggers, okay, I didn't forget. So triggers are like infectious, triggers are like trauma, pregnancy, being pregnant, transferring your antibodies, from you to your child in the last trimester um, can create autoimmune issues with patients. Delivering the child seems to set off autoimmune responses. How many of you out there going, I was fine, then I had a child, and I put on weight. I thought no big deal, it was going to go away. It didn't go away. I'm tired. I never got I never got better again. Next thing you know, I started getting these pain. Pregnancy, traumas. Had one the other day. Um, uh, surgery. Surgery. I had hip surgery. Next thing you know, my whole body hurt. We see it a lot with peripheral neuropathy. I had hip surgery. Next thing you know, I got pain, numbness, tingling, burning in your feet. That's another big and stress. We talked about stress in the beginning, and I, I think that kind of covers that a lot. Covers a lot of them. Yeah. Those are triggers. Mm -hmm. Those are triggers. People want to know the cause of fibromyalgia, but those are the triggers of fibromyalgia. And a lot of people want to know what the symptoms are. I, and I want to go over that, and then I think you really should get into, you know, the brain. Okay. Well, the brain does it, but what would you say, the symptoms of fibromyalgia, the, the things that we find out are involved in fibromyalgia are usually an autoimmune problem, mm -hmm. frequently. Frequently, it's thyroid, it's gut, and for those of you that develop dizziness and vertigo and balance problems out of nowhere, cerebellum. Um, um, we, we see um, uh, gut, I said that, did I say that? We, we see usually gut problems, because a lot of people who develop 
Mm -hmm. I have Hashimoto's, okay? That's an autoimmune attack on your thyroid. Those of you who have fibromyalgia, you should look it up. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you, or look at our last hangout, okay? And, and people who have that have an awful good chance of having celiac. You eat, you have diarrhea, you eat something, you bloat. If you don't eat it, you don't bloat. Um, that, the gut has 70% of your immune system in there, it has all the chemistry, most all the chemistry that makes your brain and everything work. Gut's usually involved, most of you have bad gut. Most of you have bad thyroid, most of you have an autoimmune problem. You, most of you have the brain issues that Dr. Gates is going to talk about. Would you say that's fibromyalgia kind of Yeah, encompasses it, absolutely. And the other problem is a lot of you have been tested for your thyroid and you're told it's normal. You've been tested for your adrenal glands and you're told that it's normal. Right. Just keep in mind, go back to that one thing I mentioned to where there are hormones that come from the brain that talk to the thyroid. There are hormones that come from the brain that talk to the adrenal glands. And the really fascinating part for me is that a lot of fibromyalgia patients, they can inject those hormones that come from the brain to the thyroid or the adrenal glands. And the thyroid and the adrenal glands don't respond. They don't produce the hormones the way you would expect. But by the same token, it's not bad enough to be diagnosed as a horrible thyroid condition some of the time. It's not bad enough most of the time right, to so be diagnosed as a horrible adrenal gland condition like Addison's disease. Right. And then, but we're also seeing that the immune system is highly involved against the thyroid with a lot of fibromyalgia patients. So you can start to see how complex it is. And what Dr. Rutherford is saying when he's saying, you know, you can have a bad thyroid, you can have a bad adrenal glands, you can have functional hypercortisolism. That's this new thing out now. But they're saying the person doesn't have cushy English. Okay. So if the person has too much cortisol, cortisol is a stress hormone that tends to imbalance the immune system as well as. Uh, increasing blood sugar, that's why we have cortisol, so we can walk out into this desert here in Reno and sit there for 30 days as long as we have water and we'll keep our blood sugar stable so our brain can function. But they're seeing now patients with fibromyalgia can have too much cortisol throughout the day. And that too much cortisol can be a bad thing relative to the immune system, relative to repairing the gut, relative to repairing skin. Um, and also, it can be hard on the brain. It can cause the person to kind of feel brain foggy. It can, for to have brain fog, it can cause them to not be able to remember as well as they would like to. So I think that explains it relative to functional hypercortisolism. But they call it functional because the person doesn't have Cushing's disease. Cushing's disease patients have a moon face. They tend to be about 100 pounds overweight, and they have a pendulous abdomen. They get these purple streaks or stretch marks on their skin. But what we're seeing is that fibromyalgia patients can have the same or similar cortisol levels to a Cushing's patient, but they don't have Cushing's disease. So in other words, unless you're practically dead, you're not going to get diagnosed through right. the lab test. Exactly, exactly. So now let's go to the brain. It's a little bit too late to, to bring you back, but yeah, yeah let's go I, I, I would. So let's say this I would is think the brain. Let's say this is a knife. Is the most underappreciated aspect of agree. all chronic pain. I would agree, and that's and, why. And and. This is why this is hugely important because it just seems like the literature is out there, but nobody seems to get it, and it is the cornerstone of the success of a lot of what our patients are able to accomplish here. So this is hugely important. Pay attention. Speak in English. Okay. <laughs> so let's say this was a knife, and accidentally that knife went into my hand. Let's say, let's hopefully say that it doesn't penetrate too far, but I get cut. I will have little pain nerves. They're called nociceptors. I'm sorry, but I have to make this distinction. All right, clear. well, they're fine. Then. Okay. <laughs> Nociception or nociceptors are little nerves that transmit pain signals. But what you need to know, and if you have to keep rewinding this to get this, please do it, because you have to know that it's not pain until it gets to your brain. It's not pain until it gets to your brain. So here it's nociception. And those nociceptive fibers will send signals up into my arm, up into my neck, up into my spinal cord, then up to my brain. Now, 75% of these signals actually will never make it up to the conscious part of the brain. They'll go to the subconscious part of the brain that doesn't really feel pain. With me on this? <laughs> you let me know if I'm doing okay relative to my lay explanation. So far, so good. Okay. So 75% will not make it to the conscious area of the brain. Only 25% make it to the conscious area of the brain. So that's a very, very important distinction because lots of times people say, I have so much pain in my muscles and there's so much going on. Well, really the problem is for many fibromyalgia patients is that Dr. Rutherford has these nociceptive fibers sending signals into his 
his spinal cord and up to his brain. But not he, as much as I used to. But he's not feeling as much pain as he used to. Right. Largely because right, you, can, less. you can shift the balance as to how many of these signals get through the spinal cord up to the brain. You can also shift the balance in terms of how much the brain is going to dampen out these signals coming to the brain. Does that make sense? When I started my treatment, by the way, when I started my search, I started with the brain. Right. And learned a number of very simple things at that mm -hmm. time. We're way more ahead of that. And, and reduced my pain quite a bit based on what Dr. Gates is talking about right now. So know that it's all about the balance when you're feeling pain. If you're feeling pain all over your body and you've been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, most likely there's too much fuel in the fire, meaning you're feeling way too many of these pain neurons or nociceptive neurons coming into your, into your spinal cord and your brain is not shutting them off appropriately. That is the foundation. And from there, if you have a, a doctor who is skilled I'm not going to say that way. Let's just say if you're seeing someone who's very uh, abreast with the fibromyalgia literature, then you can delve into the stress mechanisms, the immune mechanisms, the inflammatory mechanisms, the motor vehicle action mechanism, the pregnancy mechanism, all these other things that must have done something to shift that balance of increasing nociception or decreasing the the mechanism shutting off the nociception coming into your Would it be fair to say if this mechanism wasn't working right that putting your socks on would be painful? For a lot of our fibromyalgia patients, it is. I mean, some of them can't even wear clothes. But I'm just saying, the, I'm just the, saying the mechanism person. itself, that, that we have a natural mechanism to block out pain. Right. The, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Is, is I don't feel the jacket on my back. Exactly. And so if we didn't have this mechanism working and continually filtering out pain, we'd be in pain all the time your mechanisms are being broken down and so you're feeling pain and to the degree that they're breaking down you're feeling more pain and do you want to talk about I think here's another key when I talk to patients and they come in I do the consults first to try to kind of kind of fuel patients out and see if they're kind of you know maybe going to be comfortable with our program um, and one of the big things that seems to cognite with patients is the central sensitization I mean these people all these people think they're crazy right. they think it's in their head right. and what Dr. Gates is saying it kind of is in your head, <laughs> okay, because this is where you're sensing the pain. It's not in the muscle fibers. The problem's over here. The problem's not over here. But the central sensitization, um, and we're going to define that in a second, seems to really cognite with people. In other words, you feel pain much more than the average person feels pain. Yes, because the pain is now in your brain. The pain has become learned. Because that fake filter hasn't filtered it out. It's overwhelmed the brain to the point where the brain is now learning pain. If you go back to, and I try to get too scientific on this, but we try to cut across the broad spectrum here. But, but, this, but we want you to know that we're not making this stuff up. Okay? And, and we utilize these methods and this data in our procedures, and it's pretty successful when you know what you're dealing with. And, and so, um, so just to go over that again, you have a pain mechanism that uh, is in place to filter out pain all the time. It gets broken down because of a number of other things. These 80 things that we talk about, uh, the stress and the stress and the, and the and the sexual abuse and the physical abuse and the and the overwhelming infections and these things that build up. Uh, I, I mean, I can go on for an hour, but those things build up. They break this. They, they break the system down. Breaks down starts going into your brain. Now your brain starts to learn pain. It's good when you use your brain to learn how to play the piano. If you play, the, like Dr. Gates said, if you play the piano over and over again, or like our young man who was the math genius, they do math over and over again, your brain's going to learn that. You're actually going to get neurons that are going to like, you're actually going to get brain cells that are recruited from other areas of the brain to help you do that if that's what you concentrate on all the time. The combination of things that Dr. Gates just talked about results in your brain learning pain. pain. Not a good thing. And then your brain can't shut it off. And then your brain can't shut it off. And how do we study. shut it off? People ask, what kind of medications? <laughs> we use the medications. And but those of you we who don't use, use medications. We don't use yes. the medications. We as a population use the medications. Right. And when usually by the time a patient gets to us, they've tried the Neurotin, they've tried the Lyrica, right. they've tried the Dental, they've tried the Civella. Uh, by that time, a lot of them are on to like the more serious pain medications. But basically, some work for some people, some don't work for other people. Most work for a short period of time, then you have to go to another. But it's shutting down basically your brain's ability to perceive pain. Mm -hmm. Let me.
Let yeah. me interject. Yeah. So, okay, I, I can't withstand it. No, that's cool. So, uh, arthritis and rheumatology 2014, disrupted brain circuitry for pain-related reward <laughs> slash punishment and fibromyalgia. Look it up. Okay. That, that's all what? I have to say. <laughs> I wasn't even listening. I had fibromyalgia. <laughs> Good. No, I, I, well, I did have it. Disrupted brain circuitry for pain related reward punishment and fibromyalgia. Okay, so that's talking that, that's about what exactly what we're saying. saying. For those of you who are, are research nerds, look it up. For those of you who are not research nerds, just know it is in your head. And without addressing the aspect of the brain, for those of you who are, okay, so for those of you who are looking for non drug methods for this, okay? Um, Technically, the medical approach addresses the brain, even though that you're not aware of that. It dampens the brain's mechanisms mm -hmm. by yeah, using these drugs. Mm -hmm. There is a trade-off, and if you have never come upon an alternative method that's been successful for you, maybe that trade-off is okay. But eventually, just know you're going to suffer from that. You're going to suffer side effects from having your brain neurons um, dampened for over a period of time. And again, you know, I'm not an anti-medicine. Neither am I. That is a, uh, it's a valid way to go if you're not aware of anything else. The, the problem in the alternative field, and I'm not anti-alternative <laughs> field either, but the, but, the, but the way that the alternative field has developed is, you know, and it's our whole society, let's try and figure out an easy way to do this. I'm going to tell you there's no easy way to do fibromyalgia. There's a way to do it, but it's not like going to be a pill. It's not going to be somebody, some people know that the gut is heavily involved in fibromyalgia. Let me tell you, the gut is heavily involved in fibromyalgia. And that's a whole discussion into itself, which we will eventually get into, not today. But, um, but if you fix the gut and, and you don't fix other things that are involved, the gut might help your brain. But if the brain's still desynchronized or, if it's, or you still have that mechanism that is being overwhelmed, the pain is just going to come back. By the way, that mechanism damages your gut. So you have this vicious cycle that you have to break, and you have to break it here. You have to break it in the brain. I mean, it's pretty, you know what I do with talking? I say, what is the brain control? Everybody says everything. Everybody says everything. Everybody. Everybody gets that the brain controls everything. But for some reason, it's hard for us to embrace that when brain function is abnormal, it creates a lot of these chronic situations that we have. And because there's not a drug for it, and because the science isn't really um, friendly towards the alternative fields, uh, we don't really, we're not really conversant with the fact that this is where you got to go. You, you have to affect, you have to treat, you have to acknowledge that the brain is there. There's tons of non-drug ways to do it, but I started to say in the alternative field, we still are kind of in in the berberine thing, we st which we use. In, in different cases, we're kind of still in the take uh, curcumin. take curcumin, take curcumin. Effective. We're back now to the inflammatory thing. The vitamins, um, mitochondrial support. Yeah, all these different things, and these are all I call it nibbling. I'm not, I'm not criticizing. It's an it's an evolution um, that has taken place that has allowed us to get where we are. Frankly, in a sense of a full comprehensive understanding of what's going on. But it is, it's, it's, this is a complex, comprehensive issue that demands a complex, comprehensive history, exam, and solution. And, but our challenge is continually to get pe pe people are now kind of conversant and able to embrace an alternative method, cleanses, the different types of things that Dr. Gates talked about, vitamins, supplement, herbs. Ironically, herbs are not good. A lot of herbs are not good for our types of patients that have these problems. But, but we, we're just still um, looking for ways to better educate people, people and help them to embrace and understand <laughs> the brain as part of it. And the brain can be evaluated without sticking you in an MRI, although it's helpful, without doing an EEG on you, although it's helpful. But it can be functionally evaluated through a thorough neurological exam, something which most of you have never, ever had and probably never will have in this lifetime, unless he doesn't. <laughs> Let's one of us do it, but he does it all that right now because he's better than I am at it. And so, um, 
So unless you get that, you can tell what parts of the brain aren't functioning right. We had a patient who was in here yesterday again, and, and this patient was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I'm absolutely certain she doesn't have it. But she had an MRI finding of her brain that could be something else, and we happen to think we She had a negative CSS. What is yeah, she had ne the one major test for multiple sclerosis, which is a cerebral spinal fluid test, was normal. Um, and it's probably because she doesn't have multiple sclerosis. It's probably because she has another inflammatory thing, which we happen to think is her thyroid, because she's like screaming uh, autoimmune thyroid problems, which can create inflammation in the brain. So again, I want to make this point relative to diagnosis. We're, we're hitting a wide spectrum here of the questions that we see that people want to know online. Diagnosis. Can you look at somebody's brain and say they have this problem? Not unless you have a really comprehensive history that says, okay, it could be these 80 things. By the time you get down with the history, now you go, okay, it's down to these five things. Now you do an exam and go, of these five things, it can only be these three right. things. Now you look at the MRI, and now that inflammation has meaning. That's diagnosis, folks. It's probably been that way since I was in school, and, and that was in the mid-70s. And nothing's changed, but we've gotten to the point where, I mean, back then we didn't have MRI. We didn't have CAT scans. We didn't have all this stuff. We knew that the blood testing wasn't consistently like something that you wanted to hang your hat on. So we were taught you had to do a history. We were taught you had to do a thorough exam. And then that your testing should be targeted and specific. I mean, we don't do that much testing, really, if you think about it. Right. Compare, we do very targeted testing right. and very uh, testing that is useful. But compared to what our patients have experienced when oh, they get yeah, in here, yeah. oh my God! I mean, geez. And I think we've we've hit our hour. Well, we started late, but you know that's okay. I think we I think we've probably gone over. Um, I, I I what we really want to do is like give you some sort of an idea of the overall of a fibromyalgia. You feel like we did that? Yes. You feel like there there are four different essential categories that we have observed. Okay, I wouldn't look for those in the literature no. in, in that category because. This is where we work. This is what we do. We base our, our observations on what we do and the success of response to treatment to the things that we find. And we get pretty consistent results these days as a, as a, as a result. Um, but Dr. Gates certainly here is here to introduce the literature to show you that we, you know, that we're, we're attentive to what's going on out there. And it's out there. The things that are wrong with you are out there. They just maybe aren't conversive to the present medical model. That's something you need to know. You need to know it's not in your head. Well, it is in your head, but it's not in your head. <laughs> okay, you do. It is. It has a lot to do with your brain and the way it perceives pain, and the way it experiences pain. But it's not in your head. You don't need to go pull on your big boy pants. You don't need to go to see a psychologist. You're not crazy. You need. And if you, if your husband or a significant other, you need to have them look at this so they know you're not crazy. I can get in the left brain, right thing, brain thing. I can get into the symptoms of how you have brain fog. We'll do that another time. Brain fog and short-term memory loss and how you're not motivated because your left brain is, is probably you know, totally trashed by this and, and you're probably late to appointments and, you, and, and on and on and on and on. There's just, we could talk about this for like probably 25 hours. But the reality is we felt like we wanted to lay a baseline for you and let you know that there's a lot of science behind what's going on with you. And there are a lot of things that can be done if you know where to start, we just kind of want to give you an idea of where to start and, and, and what you should be looking for in a physician if you are you know, going to someone for fibromyalgia, the fact that it's real, the fact that the term is dumb, the fact that it doesn't mean anything, the fact that it's multifactorial, the things that are set it off, and, and the things that will perpetuate it. So I think we've kind of covered that. Today. I think so. I think we also need to reiterate that our program seems to work because we properly select the right patient. People who come to us will do what we need them to do in terms of changing their diet, their lifestyle, these stressors, and we feel that is a major component why we're seeing some success, we'll say it that way, with our treatment uh, population. And if you're interested in learning more about us, go to powerhealthtalk.com, powerhealthtalk.com. Go to the top bar, that's where the hangouts are. And we'll be putting more of these out Can every week. Can they access our website? Uh, yeah, powerhealth.com. Is that our website? Powerhealthreno.com. I'm computer alert. Powerhealthreno.com. Yeah, and then we'll have some more snippets that we're doing today on, on thyroid. Okay. 
five-minute clips. All so, right. Okay. Thank see you, you so much. Time. All right. We'll see you soon. Hope you enjoyed it. All right. Bye-bye.